like to welcome you to Boy Meets Wellness, a podcast that discusses the complexities, celebrations, and challenges of building a wellness ritual as a BOI, a person who is born obviously incredible. You are now listening to Boy Meets Wellness with poet, motivational speaker, and wellness lover, Evolve Benzo. BOI, born obviously incredible, especially when you wear it pretty. Hello, September, top of the month, Boy Meets Wellness community. I'm so excited for our new listeners. Thank you for checking out the podcast. We really appreciate you. Here at Boy Meets Wellness, we talk tools for you to live an incredible life. Those tools are money, mindset, motivation, and wellness. And we gather resources to develop these tools by interviewing and sharing the stories of people who are boys, born obviously incredible. If you're feeling the tagline, born obviously incredible, We have a merchandise line called Boy Gear. Check out Boy Gear at boygearstore.com and grab some of our new clothing, a fanny pack, water bottle, or journal. Use code SUMMER for 20% off. Today's interview features Janae Johnson. Janae Johnson is a writer, performer, educator, podcast host, and DJ. She's a Women of the World Poetry Slam finalist, National Poetry Slam champion, and a write- Bloody Book Award finalist. Janae is the founder of two nationally recognized poetry venues, and her work has appeared in outlets and stages such as ESPN, PBS, NewsHour, Lenny Says, SF Jazz, and Button Poetry. Janae's new podcast, Why Not Put On, interviews Black poets on their favorite Black movie, how it has informed their art, relationships, and identities. Before we jump into that interview with the amazing and talented Janae Johnson, I would like to share the wellness tip of the week. This week's wellness tip is to pick a day of the week to reclaim your sleep and take a nap. This amazing resource I found on Instagram through my partner is the Nap Ministry. I'll leave their link in the show notes so that you can check them out. But essentially, their mission is to normalize rest, and their belief is that rest is a form of resistance and reparations. So yes, we want you to reclaim your time and resist against the capitalist productivity model that says you need to deplete yourself to actually be worthy of anything. So instead of doing that, we want you to head into your room, into your cot, into your Havana if you got that going on and take an amazing nap, have a good time, get some rest, restore your body and check out the nap ministry. Today's episode is brought to you by Mar Media Productions. Mar Media is a media production company that produces, publishes, and uplifts the stories, arts, and journeys of queer and trans people of color and the people who make our lives incredible. Now for our interview with Janae Johnson. Hello, world. Welcome to Boy Meets Wellness. It's your boy, Evolve. I'm super juiced about today's conversation with Janae Johnson. Janae, welcome to Boy Meets Wellness. Can you just tap in with your name, where you're located right now, and what brings you joy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm super excited for this interview. My name is Janae Johnson. I am currently located in Tacoma, Washington, of all places, but that is not where I am from. I am from California, Sacramento, and also Rep. Oakland, and have been, you know, around the United States. Yeah, a lot of different states over the years. But, but yeah, Cali, live in Washington. And what brings me joy? Music specifically Motown music, oldies, Black movies, barbecues, gatherings, mostly Black folks, if I could help it, and getting things done. (laughs) That that brings me joy. That's beautiful. So tell me a little bit about, like, one, what are your pronouns? Because I always want to get that right. And if you and if you're at the barbecue, you know, you say you love a barbecue. Are you are you a little finicky like me? Like I know for myself, I don't really do everybody's barbecue sauce. So I'm going to ask for a little bit of dry and then, you know, I'll do the sauce, test the sauce out. Are you just going all the way in? For sure. So my pronouns are she, her. And uh, thank you for asking. And um, uh, but the barbecue sauce, that's that's an interesting question because I, I haven't really thought about that. I, I'm OK. I could go all the way in. I'm not finicky about about people's sauce. I'm just finicky about other people's food. So <laughs> so if, if if I don't really trust you on a girl, I ain't eating nothing but like the hot dogs, but the things that I know you can't really mess up. You just got to 
warm them up type of thing. But the sauce, no, nah, I'll, I'll taste people's sauce if, if I trust, you know, how, how I see them grilling. Uh, I got to evaluate the situation. That's real talk. I mean, I've I've been to a few of your kickbacks and, you know, you, you can definitely get down in the kitchen. So I'll give you that. But I also think that you're just amazing at building community, making sure it's a safe space. And some of that is making sure that the food that's actually there is, is legit. You know what I mean? So I really, look, I really appreciate that about you. Look, you can't, you can't be out here trusting people's food like that. You know, part of, part of it is that I, I don't know. I came from like a family and community that that's what we do. But growing up and, and getting a little bit older, the folks around me just didn't know how to cook and didn't know how to barbecue. So I had to call my dad up in, in my mid twenties and be like, "Look, how, how do I how do I grill?" And then from there, he was just you know teaching me how to be a grill master. And uh, yeah, I'm trying to trying to pay it forward to the people. So on the show, we bring on people who are incredible, right? Born obviously incredible, which I consider you to be. But who in your life makes your life incredible? If you had a gratitude list, who would be the top three people that you would include on that? Wow, that's that's a great question. I mean, my parents are definitely up there. My parents are incredible. I've always been a daddy's girl. And my, my dad is, is just a, a phenomenal person. I, I feel like I'm living the life that, you know, he he probably would have wanted to live in, in you know, alternate reality. Like he, he's a creative person and an artist in his own right, in his own head. <laughs> and I, I think I, I built a better relationship with my mom as an adult. And um, I just found out that she's just incredible. And so um, my parents are definitely up there. My, my current partner, uh, Amber Flame, uh, I've, I've known her for almost a decade. We've been friends for almost a decade before we started dating. And she's just a, a very influential person in, in my life as far as listening to, to my art. Even before we started dating as a friend, just she was someone who was a great sounding board for me and always encouraged me to like dig a little bit deeper. And a good friend of mine, Portia Olaiola, who lives in Boston, Massachusetts. When I first started off with poetry, it was me and her. We would just, we were trying to conquer the world together. And it was phenomenal to, to watch how both of us grew over the years. But she's someone who I am in constant competition with and also in admiration of. <laughs> so, so I would say those, those four people. You're such an amazing storyteller. Tell me a little bit about this passion for education. Like, did you always know that you wanted to be an educator? Like, what led you to this world of education and poetry? Ooh, that's a that's a good question. I think uh, I don't know if I came into education in a in a direct way, but when I when I graduated from college, I was an athlete in college, and the the next step was for me to get a job, but I had a degree in English. And I thought like people would just, you know, like offer me <laughs> jobs left and right. And that's not what happened. I was like, oh, nobody wants nobody with an English degree that don't know what they're going to do with it. And so I, I ended up getting uh, my master's in, in higher education uh, in educational leadership from University of Delaware. And um, I only got that uh, the master's there because uh, because I was an athlete and um, I had worked in the athletic department of my undergrad. And so from there, I got into a master's program where I was exposed a little bit to the world of education outside of athletics. And I had a, a graduate assistantship, so my uh, tuition was paid. And so from there, I was around a lot of educators and kind of pursued a, a career just in in college and student affairs, essentially in athletics. And um, I was assistant athletic director in Boston. Um, and I say all this to say like it was an unorthodox thing because I was kind of just like basketball sports. That was kind of my lane. And then once I got my master's or I was not, not even my master's because I don't really think that that meant anything, but I was exposed to a different community of folks who were um, who are kind of giving back in different ways. I was able to to figure out what my path could be, and I just connected the students uh, when I was at when I was in Boston. That was kind of my thing. I, I I'm a creative, so I just would come up with ideas to engage students beyond what the folks around me knew 
or what they followed in the past years of the institution. So I just came and just shook shit up. <laughs> and, and from there, I, uh, yeah, I think I, I got a passion for, um, for just for showing up essentially. And that's mostly what, what uh, education is, is, is kind of sharing what you know um, and uh, trying something new and just showing up. Uh, nobody's going to respect an educator that don't show up. I know that's right. That's, that's, that's half of the, I mean, that's really the most of the job is showing yeah. up and, and, you know, like being there in that nine to five and, you know, you and I have offline even talked about this, this grind of higher education. What I've always respected about you is the fact that you've always kept the art first. Yeah. Like, I feel like even though, you know, I knew you had jobs, but, you know, <laughs> like what I knew about you was was your love for the art, your love for for poetry, your love for bringing people together. So how have you been able to like balance that? And what does that even balance look like for you, especially now during like this COVID-19 era? Man, I, I think I, I would say going back to just like when I was when I was first starting off with poetry, I had tried it for a year or so. And then I was like, this is hard. And then I kind of quit, but I wanted to coach. And so I coached some young people. And I felt like a hypocrite (laughs) because they were amazing and I wasn't writing. And so they actually pushed me to go back into my art. And I became a better writer because of them. And I think over the years, it's been tough because uh, holding down a full-time job, especially in higher education, and as much as people want to be progressive in higher ed, a lot of folks don't really understand what it means to be an artist as well. So I remember uh, I, I had I had won the the Woman of the World um, Poetry Slam in 2015, and I remember I went back to work the next day, and I was like, "Hey, y'all, I won." They were like, "Yeah, but you gonna answer my email though? Like, you got to try to get this answer for the past week." They did not care at all. But I think the the balance has been um, just reminding folks this is what I do and this is what I'm passionate about and really figuring out a way to incorporate that um, in, in every step of the way. And right now, this is the first time that I'm not, I'm not in full, I'm not in higher ed. Um, I stopped working in higher ed a few years ago and went to nonprofit, the nonprofit sector. And then I realized I don't like working for people. I really don't like it, especially institutions or uh, things that were built because of uh a white person. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I wanted to, to try things out on my own. And um, I, I'm, so currently I am, I'm doing a lot and I'm, I'm trying to balance out uh, my time, but I am, I'm teaching a little bit. I'm teaching mostly uh, with uh, some incarcerated women um, out here in Washington in doing um, both writing workshops and also life skills workshops and health and wellness workshops. Um, and I am, I have a business and so I'm a, I'm an agent. I represent a few artists, a few fantastic artists, um, on a roster. Um, I am currently trying to write this full length manuscript that's been eating at me for the past couple of years, but I, I think I'm, uh, I have an editor and so I'm, I'm trying to, trying to get this done. Um, I started a podcast uh, it's called Why Not Put On, and it's a, it's mostly from a Black joy standpoint. And I'm interviewing Black poets about uh, their favorite Black movies, and that's been actually a really special project. I didn't know what was going to come of it, and yeah, I'm just you know performing here and there, but I'm I'm really um, I'm really kind of grounded in in the in the organizing and and kind of staying to myself about the art. And I'm also doing some music stuff. I'm a DJ, so I, I have a lot of things that I'm juggling. And right now. Um, now that I'm not employed, uh, full-time employed, it's more so of like trying to figure out where my priority is from day to day because I'm doing so many things that I wouldn't say I'm just one thing as far as art goes. I, I have to figure out on Monday, am I prioritizing podcasting? On Tuesday, am I prioritizing writing? On Wednesday, am I prioritizing my health? You know, like I, I, I have to figure out what's my priority from day to day. And I think that's been the, the hard balance, especially with COVID. 
man, you got a lot going on. You, you're doing some amazing <laughs> things. I'm excited about this podcast. I will be sure to um, to share all of those great opportunities in our show notes so that the audience can connect with it. And I love the fact that you were able to like step out of that world of higher education and really see not only that you're a poet, right, but that you hold so much value in so many of these other places and you're still doing that 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 mentorship. I think that that's really key. So let's back up just a little bit in this story. You mentioned that you won this this slam championship and people was like, what? Cool. Where my email? What is slam? Right. Because some of our folks are listening to this. They they might just, you know, be poets in their in their journal. They don't really know what slam is. What is this? And I know how big this award is. I mean, when I heard it, I was like and I seen who you were and I've also was following the poems. I was like, yes, yes. Finally, one of us, one of the boys um, is in there and got this done. Tell people what is slam and what did you do? Right. Because people don't understand how big of a deal this is. <laughs> I appreciate that the, the question as far as what what slam is. I think people <laughs> people mix up just poetry in general, uh, the genre of spoken word and poetry slam. So poetry slam is a competition. Um, it, it, it's a competition that so they turn slam or turn spoken word into a game. So it is a competition in which poets compete. And they get scored by five judges, five people in the audience, five random people that folks are not affiliated with on a scale of zero to 10. So they, they come up, poets come up and they spit their, their heart and their soul and all their truth. And then the judges put up a score and they're like, that's about a 7.2, yo, do better. So was, there's a lot of local slams um, in a lot of the major cities, if not all of the major cities and uh, a lot of the mid-major cities, um, there's there's a lot of local slams and folks compete and they win. If they win their local slams, if they if they do well in their local slams, then they move on to like a national slam. So national slams uh, have anywhere between, for individual slams, it has anywhere between 72 and 96 people that represent their cities from across uh, you know, I, w- I would say people say the world, but the United States, they, we, we just think we the shit and we just above everybody. So we call, you know, a national slam, the world slam, but it's really just like a national slam. So uh, across the nation. And yeah, and, and we all compete with some of the some of the best poets around that are still, you know, hitting the mic. And so in 2015, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, I, I won the the Women of the World Slam, and so uh, folks who uh, identify as women were competing that year. And I believe there was, I can't remember whether there were seventy two or, or ninety six people, but yeah, I came out, I came up uh, victorious uh, that that particular year um, after uh, after uh, amazing people uh, have won the slam, you know, who I look up to. So. Um, yeah, it's still an honor that I have uh, 2015. Yeah. Congrats, man. I, I, I would applaud, you know what I'm saying? But I don't want to create too much microphone noise. We might have to bring in Notorious, um, you know, in that other side, because, you know, that's a big deal. And, you know, you're sharing your story, you're sharing your passion, and you're really being effective with it. So I know that some people, some of our other audience members are listening to this because they've been following you. And they're secretly, you know, in their closet, practicing their poems, getting ready. And they probably want to know, like, what are some tips on writing an effective poem for a slam? Like, could you provide some of that? Because I know you've coached people around the nation on being the best. And some of your folks have even won awards, right? Some of your teams have won awards as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I've coached coached a lot of a lot of baby poets that are doing big things, big things. Um, I, yeah, I, I, you know, approaching the page in a stage is, is just, it feel, it could feel intimidating. Uh, but I think the, one of the biggest pieces of advice is, hmm, I would say writing is rewriting. So, so really don't think you're the shit the first time out when you, when you write your poem, um, yeah, think about the first time you've ever tried something and or if you're organizing something into a cabinet and it and it doesn't fit and you have to like take something out in order to like 
and rearrange some things to make it fit. It's the same thing with writing. Um, you have to make sure that you are getting closer and closer to the truth. And uh, just because it's not done the first time doesn't mean it's not going to to feel uh, finished for you, or it doesn't mean it's not you're not going to accomplish um, what your mind has said. And so I, I would say the editing is super important. I would say as far as like stage and, and getting into to a slam mode, I would say study. Know what you like. Know what your style is. Um, don't study to imitate. Study to see what's out there. Study to see what you actually what attracts the eye and what attracts the ear to you. Um, and, and so, like I, I had a list of folks who I admired before while while preparing for Women of the World. I had a list of every single poet that I was like, "Yo, these people can potentially beat me in a slam because I think they're dope." And it was like 25 people on that list. And I was naming the qualities that I really admire about them, whether that be the way that they engage with the audience, with their eye contact, their, 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 uh, how they emphasize certain words, um, their, their movements on stage, the content in which they, um, the speed of the content in which they provided in their, in their poem. And so I would say, it's, I don't like to set myself up for failure. So I like to see what I'm getting myself into before I get myself into something. And so that's that's one of the biggest pieces of advice is one, edit and don't be afraid of editing. Um, don't be, don't, don't have too big of an ego <laughs> to edit and also uh, study and figure out what you like and, and, and your style. And of course, practice, you know, practice in the mirror, know what you look like uh, when you're, when you're performing just kind of get used to yourself in your body and, and hopefully you'll, you'll feel connected with your words. I hope y'all are taking some notes right now. Cause this is like the Phil Jackson of slam poetry, giving y'all like <laughs> major tips <laughs> for the free. <laughs> so I hope Not Phil Jackson. <laughs> yes. I hope y'all got, yes. Phil, Phil Jackson is all about strategy. What you gave us was not just how to win, but how to win fairly. Right. The strategy to use and that mamba mentality of practice. That was Phil right there. That was Phil. You broke, <laughs> you broke it down. You broke it down. So the other great thing that you've been able to do is create these venues, right? And what I think people don't realize is how hard work, the hard work that goes into not only creating a space, but creating a safe space. People often ask me, because I'm a poet, like, when are you going to create a journal or can you do this? They want to add themselves to a project that I haven't even created and, and put it on me. And I think people see that because you have leadership skills. But what I think you've been effective of doing is not only leading, but being able to, I wouldn't even say delegate, build a family and community um, with the community you did in Boston and in Oakland. So how was that experience just like, did you just wake up one day and you were like, yo, I want, I want a venue. I want a place where we can perform and practice and, and build, or is it, was it intentional or is it more of something that, you know, kind of just like organically happened? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Also, you're an amazing interviewer. I just want to say that just, you know, just put that out. Oh, thank you. I've been yeah. working on it. I'm trying to get, yeah, you know, I'm trying to find myself the National Center Oprah. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to, I'm trying yeah. to get out. Thank you for yeah. that. I feel very at ease and, you know, you ask me good questions. I, I would say, so both situations were, were really different and I, I usually organize when there's a need for it. I, I never put on an event or a barbecue or anything if, if someone is already doing it in the way that I feel like is good or that I appreciate, I don't I don't organize. I try not to. It's a lot of work, yo. So Boston, uh, the way that Boston happened was uh, I was slamming predominantly at one venue that was very, uh, it had a heavy Black population very heavy dude population and they were very homophobic and you know in, in their in a very subtle you know I'm the I'm a homophobic type of way and but they would do some really and say some very violent things uh, you know about women about queer folks and but that was a home of mine for a while um, and it just got to a bubbling point where it's like we can't do this anymore the other alternative to that, was this very white venue that uh, was very grungy 
and just extreme. It, it was it was white enough to where you would look across the room, see another black person and be like, what you doing here? <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and I and I love the folks in that venue and I got a lot from that venue, but, you know, it just was not it was never for me. Um, and so myself and uh, Portia, we, we had been slamming for both of these venues for for a few years, for like three or four years. And we were like, and we still weren't getting anywhere. And we were like, we should just like create our own venue. And we just happened to be eating at at a spot that was a, a really dope um, restaurant cafe and that it hosted community events and um, hired formerly incarcerated folks and just were doing a lot for the community. And someone came up to us and we're like, oh, our open mic here is stopping in the summer. Do you want, you know, you, y'all should do an event here just randomly. And we took that opportunity and, and uh, we were like, we should just do it. And the folks there were on board and we got the community support and we just didn't know how much the community needed that. And we learned lessons from both of the venues that we were slamming from and uh, like, you know, good lessons and like, we need to do better than this lessons um, and created something special. And it was called the House Slam at the Haley House uh, Bakery Cafe in Boston. And it was beautiful. And you know, the line, it, w- it was beautiful because it was such a small venue to only fit like 60 people and everybody was, you know, <laughs> it was it was not safe, you know, (laughs) like in terms of just space, you, there was not a whole lot of wiggle room with space, but everybody felt cozy and there was a togetherness uh, because it was such a small venue. Um, And that was, that that can't be recreated at all. The line was like down the street, the first, first uh, slam that we had, and we had to turn folks away and like almost every event we had to turn folks away. Um, And did that. and, And I moved from Boston to the Bay Area, I had been waiting since I graduated college. I was I was in Virginia to be back on the West Coast. That was just always the goal. The goal was to be in the Bay Area specifically. That's where the majority of my family is. And um, I had an opportunity to to work at, at UC Berkeley and um, and you know get my get my rent paid and. Yeah, so I took it and I, I moved uh, to back to the Bay Area, and um, I kind of saw the same discrepancy in the Bay. Um, again, I was I was I, I immediately went to poetry venues and was and, and and new folks out there, and there just wasn't anything consistently that I vibed with, and uh, everybody was kind of in disarray and needing something, and so um, so yeah, starting the Root Slam in Oakland came from me being like, I'm going to do this. And uh, I also had this void I was trying to fill with not having a house slam either. I, I really, really missed it. And so um, my, my, I told my partner at the time and uh, she told me about two other folks who she likes and, and would be down to like just brainstorm with me because I, I didn't want to walk into a city that I had not lived in you know, for, for a long period of time and just be like, I'm going to run this thing. Um, I, I really asked for community feedback along the way from everybody, from the folks who are running the, the other venues, from people who are past organizers, from poets. And so, um, so yeah, the, the two people that we were asking for advice end up being part of, <laughs> part of the crew too. And they were like, we know two other people. And, and they, and they brought two other folks on board and then that's how we became the the root slam. And the the space was was meant to follow kind of the same ideals that we had for house slam. I think that, um, but everybody has their organization, their different organization style. Um, and so I think that o- Oakland had a different need, of course, than than Boston and was in a different place artistically too. And so I think we just had to adjust along the way. But accountability is 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 key like in art spaces people think that freedom of speech is is just something that they could they could say and then say some fucked up things after that sorry for my language and say some some messed up things after they're like no but freedom of speech freedom of speech and um some hurtful hurtful things can be said on the microphone and how do we protect folks in spaces where 
Um, we don't we don't know people who are getting on the mic. We don't necessarily know what their background is. We don't know how they move in this world. And how do you hold a community space on a consistent ba- on a consistent basis and um, and hold the folks who are coming in and out of there accountable? And I think that's something that we're just consistently trying to learn. Or when I was there, was consistently trying to to learn and grow from. And uh, we weren't perfect by any means, but I think the the hope was for it to be something where folks felt at least good or or know that someone is is clocking it. Um, it, There's spaces that I've been in, and I'm sure a lot of people have been in where people do not care what your experience is. We're like, we're hosting this event, whatever happens, happens. We're not responsible. And I think we're just trying to unlearn that, um, that notion that, that, that folks who are hosting it cannot be responsible. Folks who are hosting it are absolutely just accountable uh, to this space as accountable as folks who are harming people in the space. And so, uh, and, and even if it's just acknowledging that harm is happening, um, but yeah, just coming from a community, the poetry community, and I'm sure a lot of art artist community just have a lot of unsaid things and just trying to um, have people be more vocal about what they're experiencing. That is so real. Shouts out to you. Shouts out to the Root Slam, one of the places that that I have found to be like a very healing space here in Oakland. Um, not just the the venue itself, but especially the writing workshops that y'all put on. Um, some amazing work um, has come out of that for me, and not even work that I necessarily will ever share with the world, um, but that has allowed me to do some healing and processing. So you definitely um, you did it right. You know, I, I, I know it's you said it's not perfect, um, but it was perfect for me. And I'm sure that so many folks got some some good healing out of that space. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So before we jump into our last segment, which is Boy Talk and Hop, I was wondering, and you don't have to, if you want to share one of your favorite poems. I know people are going to want to wonder if that is on this episode, but this is this is all about consent because we are Boy Meets Wellness, so we talk about wellness and well-being. So I also would appreciate if you set up that boundary if you don't want to as well. Uh, you, so you're asking to spit a piece for asking me to spit a piece? Yeah, it could be your piece. Uh, it could be one of your favorite poems, however however you want to flow into oh, it, whatever man. you want to share with the community. I, I do not feel prepared right now to, to to spit a piece. I apologize. I apologize. Um, but but yes, uh, another time, another time. I got you. No worries. Thank you for that. So what I know we talked a little bit about like projects that you're working on, but how do folks get connected to that? Like how would they, you know, if they wanted to hire you to do one of these amazing workshops or if they wanted to just talk to you more about consultation or maybe building their own venue, how will folks find you connect um, and get into your work? For sure. Um, Thank you for the put on. I, so, so I, I, a few things I, um, you could, you could contact me. My booking email is booking at Y N M E. So, uh, so why not me? Y N M E. Uh, creatives.com looking at why me creatives.com and uh and we could we could set that up if you have any any questions any inquiries um you could also find me on the socials my uh instagram is say she ain't fresh uh i remember i was being introduced by some host and he was like satiate fresh i was like what? Um, so he just kept messing up the the names, but it say she ain't fresh. I have a thing with uh, with names that is hard to pronounce uh, with with things. But uh, my Twitter is Janae Dash Johnson, um, and you could also hit me up on Facebook. I try not to be on Facebook because a lot of family members are consistently on Facebook, and it, it just becomes overwhelming. Um, but yeah, you give me up through all the mediums and I have a podcast, a new podcast called Why Not Put On? I'm trying to be a better interviewer, but I think the the guest artists have really been shining in the in the podcast and I'm talking black movies with black poets. And so you could you could check that out. Why is a letter not a word? Again, I'm really bad with names, but why not? put on. So they're putting on their favorite black movie. Uh, you could also check me out and follow me through there. 
Uh, and lastly, I know there's a lot, there's a lot. Uh, I am DJ Summersoft. Summersoft is a Stevie Wonder song. And so uh, DJ Summersoft, and you can follow me through there uh, after this month. I'm trying to set up, uh, we have a bonus room in this house, I'm trying to set up the bonus room to, to be a better sound studio and a place where I could do live DJ sets. So I'll probably uh, in the month of October uh, be be doing more live DJ sets through Twitch or uh, Mixcloud. So check me out through there. I play mostly oldies, R&B, uh, some hip hop. But yeah, yeah. Oldies for the new soul is, is my is my saying, is my motto. You be jamming too. You be jamming. So everybody just look into the show notes. We'll have all that information there so you can get involved and get into this good music, get into this good art and get some healing going. Because I think that that's that's really the work that you're doing. So let's let's tap into some manifestations, Janae. Where do you see yourself in the next five years? Let's call it in. Like, what, Where do we see ourselves? Ooh, 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 ooh. Uh, this is great. <laughs> um, I, I see myself um, having already published a, a, a book, um, actually two books. Um, I, uh, I, I, I want to do a book of monologues and also a book of poems. So I see myself with that. Um, I see myself writing and, and producing more music um, than poetry, but sometimes poetry will go with the music. But I see myself going into the, to a more musical route and um, see the the business that I have, um, the the booking agency, and the um, yeah, I see it being a, an entire organization that um, folks can kind of find uh, both joy and um, and find black poets and uh, people of color who are uh, amazing artists that are doing. Um, great things in the world and, and being able to use that as, as so, somewhat of a tool for them to get the resources that they need for their institution, for their school, for their community. Um, I, I really want that for both the artists and the community. And so I see that being something bigger, uh, bigger and better than what it is right now and hosting different events uh, for, for folks. Um, so those are the things that I, I see in the next five years. I say, I say, we calling it in. I can't wait. I can't wait to pick up these <laughs> books. I can't wait to pick up these books and read and, you know, and see you in that light. I'm very excited and I can definitely see that vision. So let's jump into Boy Talk and Hop. This is like a fill in the blank type of um, game, I guess you could say. I'm going to give you a phrase and you just give me whatever is on the end of that for you. Sound good? I will try my best. You got this. You got this. No. My favorite book is. All right. My favorite book right now at this exact moment is I am not Sydney Poitier. <laughs> nice. Who's the author there? Percival uh, Everett. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's a, it's just. I yeah. It, it kind of feel. It's a really funny book and really smart book, and it kind of fills my joy in a in a way that a lot of books have not in a while. Love is. Hmm. Uh, I, I want to say something that's that's not as. First, I was going to say love is is uh, love is intentional. Money is weird. <laughs> if you could speak to anyone dead or alive, who would it be, and what would you do? I would speak to my to my uh, to my late grandmother, uh, my my dad's mother, and uh, we would we would be in the backyard kicking it and hopefully smoking weed and yeah. And talking shit. I, she, she passed at a, at a young, when I was, when I was, I was old enough to, to know her, but uh, not old enough to, to really like engage with her. Um, so yeah, I would definitely love to kick it with her. Thank you for bringing in that grandmother energy. Yeah. My favorite food is eggs. <laughs> I'm about the I'm about this egg life. Um, I could say something more extravagant, but at the end of the day, I need to, I need some eggs in my life. Scrambled or are you more of a boiled? How you like it? Yo, any type of way. Like I I am actually someone who is not particular about the way that I'm eating eggs. So if it's in front of me, 
and it's an egg, I'm going to eat it, yo. Uh, so, uh, but I'll, I'll usually do it scrambled. Music is? Music is uh, one word. Music is all around us. Music is everything. Wellness is? Wellness is, these are, these are good. These are good fill in the blanks. Wellness is, I want to say important and I want to say intentional, but I'm trying to figure out a better way of saying what I actually mean. Wellness is forever. It's eternal. It's something that that you have to keep doing. And last but never least, Janae is? Janae is ambitious. (laughs) Janae is ambitious. I agree, fam. Thank you so much for this interview. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of our history, you know, and, you know, telling telling the stories that need to be told, but also being very intentional about how you're doing it um, in a way that leads people to, I think, becoming their best selves. So you just you're Mm. just so appreciated. And I'm really thankful for this interview. Thank you so much for having me again. You're you're an amazing interviewer. Uh, thank you for the love. Thank you for also asking questions that I'm. Uh, they're going to sit with me for the rest of the day. So appreciate you, fam. Thank you so much for listening to Boy Meets Wellness. You can listen to more episodes and become even more incredible by heading over to boymeetswellness.com and checking out some of our resources. We really appreciate you. Have an incredible day. My name is Janae Johnson, and I am born, obviously, incredible. Thanks for listening to Boy Meets Wellness. Stay connected on and off the show by following us online at Boy Meets Wellness. That's boy with an I. Until next time.